So, Ambassador, thank you very much for your time. I know you're winding up here in Guyana. I may be wrong or presumptuous, but I, I would say that in recent times, much of your work in Guyana has been focused on getting U.S. private investment into Guyana. Uh, could you tell me how that's going? You are absolutely right, Neil, and thank you. It's wonderful to see you again. It's wonderful to have this interview. But that has been uh, a real priority for Embassy Georgetown. It was one of my top priorities to make sure that uh, I told and my staff told U.S. companies the story of Guyana and all of the wonderful opportunities that are available to investors right now. So we did spend a lot of time over these years uh, contacting U.S. companies. And to be honest, we didn't start during the dark days of COVID. We worked the phones, we had webinars, we did a lot of things virtually during those days. And then when things opened up, we hosted trade missions here. We had a very large Louisiana trade mission, the largest U.S. trade mission ever um, to Guyana. We had a large Florida delegation as well as others. And all of those trade missions resulted in deals. And so when I first arrived here, we, there were a handful of uh, U.S. companies here, very, very big companies <laughs> that you might know. Um, but we were really focused on small and medium-sized uh, companies because they tend to be the engine of change for, for any uh, nation. And so we were able to, together uh, with the Guyanese, uh, attract a lot of U.S. companies to come here and explore, and many of them chose to invest. Some of them even just small family-owned companies that were first-time investors overseas. So it's so exciting to see all of these companies be successful. Um, we do tell them to come with a plan, do their homework, have an idea you know, of what you want to do, and then get a local partner. So most of them, the successful ones, have listened to our advice, and we're so pleased to see them doing so well. Any examples you want to cite of the new ones that have been able to come in, or, or what fruits have come out of those engagements well, in the, the past? Well, the family-owned business, one of the ones I'm talking about is out of Alabama, uh, Mobile, Alabama, um, Meyer Marine, and they're in shipping, and they had never thought about investing overseas, but they heard this Guyana story, and they were one of the ones that uh, did their research. They came here, which we always say is important, to establish trust, and they decided to invest. And besides investing, they're giving back. They're training uh, Guyanese to be welders and uh, con do construction in, uh, at high standards, et cetera. So they have really done well here. In terms of other new companies, well, I was at the Building Expo uh, last week, which was really big and uh, a lot of different companies there. The U.S. had a number of companies. Two that uh, come to mind are New Century, which is building uh, affordable homes uh, for Guyanese, and they have a contract to build 200 of them right away. And it was just so impressive to see how their creative technology works. They have a lot of prefabricated materials, and they can actually put up a, a modest home, but it's three bedrooms, so it's not that modest, uh, but an affordable one-level home in less than a month and at a, at a cost that uh, many Guyanese can easily afford. So that's exciting. And then Machine Tech uh, is another U.S. company. They've been here for a little bit, but a very small company um, doing a lot in metalworks and uh, piping and such. So they are involved in the uh, petroleum industry, but also they make furniture. And they uh, had some very interesting pieces out there. They had tables and chairs and this very creative chandelier that was um, exciting to see that even within some of these companies, they're diversifying their work. So then when you're, when you're selling Guyana, when you're pitching Guyana, are you saying, come and, and look at what's available in this sector or that sector, or, or have you been spreading a wide net? Well, you know, we think it's very important that uh, Guyana diversify the economy because if they don't, they could fall victim to the oil curse, as have many countries that find themselves in this you know, new day of having all these oil resources. So we spread the wealth and we talk to in potential investors across the board. So not just oil and gas, but agriculture, manufacturing, IT, uh, services, tourism, et cetera. 
And it, the story is resonating. Uh, people, investors are very interested in looking at Guyana, you know, as the fastest or at least one of the fastest growing economies in the world at 60% last year, looking ahead at maybe upwards of 25% for the next few years they would be silly to not look at Guyana. So we've been very clear that um, come in eyes, eyes open, there are still some barriers to uh, investment. There are still some challenges um, with the infrastructure, you know, poor infrastructure, high cost of electricity, um, and, you know, not a lot of people uh, and um, some, some skills that need to be developed. But when these investors come in eyes wide open, you know, they are very impressed. So I wanted to ask you about uh, the agreement signed maybe a year ago uh, with the Exim Bank and the $2 billion that was available for U.S. companies. I wanted to know if any had tapped into that specifically. There are a few um, that are in the works right now, a, a few deals in the works right now. Um, some of them have taken a little bit longer because they're of a significant size. But yes, that was a very exciting moment, a $2 billion MOU that will unlock much of this investment for some of these companies. And that will be important, again, especially for the smaller, medium-sized companies. And I think Guyana is very interested in working with Exim Bank. Uh, have U.S. companies been uh, finding it a challenge with um, complying with Guyana's local content regulations? Uh, to date, I have not heard of a lot of difficulty. Uh, you know, I think Guyana wants to protect certain um, jobs for its citizens, and that makes a lot of sense. I think a lot of nations would do the same. Um, but I think there's also an understanding that Guyana doesn't have all the talent it needs right now, especially across all those sectors that I mentioned. So some of that talent uh, needs to be grown, which is why when we talk to companies, we do encourage them to do what I just mentioned um, that um, uh, the company in Alabama is doing and offer training courses for folks because it it was normal that Guyana wouldn't have had all these skills uh, years ago because this boom was not fully unexpected, but it came quickly. Yeah. Um, so many of these companies are off offering unique and, and needed training opportunities for citizens. And you, before you had expressed concerns about ease of doing business in Guyana, have things changed? I think there are definite improvements. And I know there are efforts afoot to open um, a single window, investment uh, window, if you will, which is very important. I know roadmaps have now been created to help uh, potential investors navigate the waters, the land of many waters, if you will. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so they, they can set up their businesses more easily. But we do encourage uh, Guyana to continue to modernize its systems, to focus on transparent systems that will encourage other investors and, and give them uh, confidence that their investments will be protected. Have there been particular areas of frustration that U.S. businesses have expressed in doing business in Guyana? Um, uh, uh, companies haven't expressed a lot of detail about difficulties doing business, but what they, what they ask for is that um, when they have conversations and when uh, uh, deals are being discussed that the, the goalposts don't change, so to speak, that you know, once they've decided on a certain path that uh, the local partner sticks to that or the final agree agreement uh, you know remains as such and of course you know once a contract is signed it's very important that all parties stick to that contract and when it comes to uh, Guyanese who are interested in doing business with the U.S., mm -hmm. uh, what sort of work has been ongoing on, on that front? We've done a bit of training here in Guyana on the export business and how to export your products to the U.S. Um, there's certainly an interest here in exporting products, and there's a demand in the, in the U.S. for Guyanese products. Um, you know, coconut products come to mind, uh, very popular right now in the U.S., many other things that Guyana can offer. So we have um, certain uh, 
uh, U.S. departments like USDA, for example, has uh, done quite a bit of um, teaching uh, to uh, similar organizations here in Guyana on what the standards are, what the requirements are for compliance. And that's been very successful. It, you know, it takes time uh, to get to the point where companies are, uh, Guyanese companies, any company would be export ready for the U.S. And like Guyana wants to protect its citizens, the United States wants to protect its citizens. So that's why those rules are in place. And that's why we're pretty steadfast about sticking to them. But I think there's a lot of opportunity for, for the export market here. I wanted to ask you particularly about agriculture because Guyana is obviously big on that, trying to lead in CARICOM on that. I don't think that fresh fruits and, and vegetables can go into the U.S. market. Has there been any particular discussions on that front itself on getting Guyanese produce into the U.S.? Well, the, um, the product I know most deeply is catfish, <laughs> yeah, and that, that has been through USDA and the Food Safety Inspection Service, part of USDA. And they have done a, a lot of this training and educating um, the appropriate folks here in Guyana about what the rules are, what compliance looks like, what the documents are like, because um, they're, they're not, uh, they're not easy necessarily to uh, to navigate so it's important that they do that kind of education and that's actually moving moving along quite well so just because you're a catfish I want to ask you about that what seems to be the trouble because as I understand it um, most of the recent questions that the U.S. had, Guyana has answered those so where is that process at the moment yeah um, you are correct most were answered but not all uh, a while ago and there has been a back and forth. It seems like it's taking a long time, but it's actually... <laughs> it has been since 2017. It, uh, well, I'm not familiar. Yeah, before that, I'm only focused on uh, from 2020. And um, so therefore, it's, it's kind of uh, a little bit further along than uh, maybe what a lot of citizens think because, you know, of course, the, the Guyanese institutions, they're not going to announce every time they have a back and forth. I don't think they would anyhow. And the US, um, USDA, FSIS is not going to do that as well. But you can be assured that these organizations are speaking to each other and documents have been provided. They've been under review. They've come back to Guyana for additional information and back in the US. So I think uh, you'll be hearing it at some point in the future about this. Sure. Now, can I switch now to ask you um, a bit about Guyana's position in, in the world, being the new big oil player? How do you see Guyana at this point in time? Well, I think Guyana has certainly reached the world stage, um, and that is largely due to this incredible historic time, as you mentioned, with the oil and gas and the transformation that is here and more to come. Um, and I think as such, Guyana has really become a, a leader in its own right, certainly within CARICOM in the, the immediate region. Uh, Guyana will take over the, the leadership for CARICOM in early 2024. Uh, they've also been a leader on some important uh, bilateral uh, issues that we're working on, like food security. They've taken a, a key role in that, and in fact, are co-lead for, for food security, one of the three working groups that came out of the Summit of the Americas meeting. Um, and then within uh, you know, the Western Hemisphere, uh, they've recently acquired or, or uh, become members of the Inter-American uh, Commission, the Inter-American Human Rights Commission, which um, is a four-year term. And it really shows Guyana's focus on protecting and promoting human rights, not only just in Guyana, but in the whole region. So they've really signaled that that's important to the country. Very, very interesting, very important. And then globally, they're now one of the newest members, uh, non-permanent members of the UN Security Council. That's a huge role. So I think um, Guyana uh, is, is uh, projecting the values that we share uh, together, democracy, importance of human rights, rule of law, and they're doing that not just here in country, but in the region, in the broader hemisphere, and across the globe. And in terms of security, where do you see Guyana's place in, in, in the region? Well, yes, uh, indeed. I think Guyana has a lot of experience with um, security issues. 
and wants to get ahead of some that um, that continue to fester and uh, get get ahead of things like transnational criminal activity. You know, you have some lengthy borders here and a relatively small defense force to monitor them. So um, Guyana, and we've partnered with Guyana quite a bit on the security front. Um, you know, the recent trade wins, multi multinational complex uh, effort is really something to highlight the co cooperation in the region. And I really applaud Guyana for hosting that twice in two years. And uh, that's a big effort for a, a relatively small country. But it's so important that we work together with like-minded nations so we can call upon each other and uh, work together, especially you know, on regional security. So I think Guyana is serious about um, you know, security and wanting to uh, improve its own security and then providing lessons learned and expertise and, and sharing those lessons with others in the region and across the globe. Yes, because when uh, Secretary of State um, Pompeo came to Guyana, mm -hmm. there was um, this talk about uh, joint um, patrols almost by the border with Venezuela. That's right. Have those been ongoing? Yes, that's the uh, Shiprider Agreement that was signed back then, and there are joint exercises that, uh, that do address those issues. So uh, General Richardson has been here twice, Admiral Fowler before her. So there is excellent security cooperation to get to the, the root of many of those uh, issues and problems. And I can go back to when you just came to Guyana. Of course, you um, were dropped in when um, there was the elections. Mm -hmm. Of recent, you've been talking about the need for political leaders to come to the table. Mm -hmm. How do you suppose that will happen, given that you know there has more or less still been a fallout from 2020? You know, Guyana is such a rich, diverse nation with many ethnicities that um, I really believe that you know your strength is in this diversity. So I think coming together, and I'm talking about all parties, all peoples, coming together um, and, and talking and figuring out how all Guyanese can participate in this incredible transformation. That will be Guyana's true success because it is a small nation, well, a large geographic nation with a small population. And um, you need all, all of your people. Uh, to be successful. And I believe there are opportunities for all Guyanese to be successful, regardless of their race, their ethnicity, gender, uh, disability, or uh, where they live. You know, because I think rural Guyana will want to participate as well. So I really believe it's important to incorporate the thoughts, opinions of as many Guyanese as possible. You know, Neil, we all see the world through a different lens, and everyone has different thoughts on uh, what maybe success looks like. But the more you listen, the more you hear those diverse thoughts, the richer the nation will be. Yeah, but you've been listening to political leaders. What can they do? I think they can talk to each other, they can listen to each other, and they can work together on, in areas of mutual interest. And we know there are some of those. Um, certainly, uh, you know, the one that always comes to mind is the border issue with Venezuela, and that's important. And we've seen, we've seen them work together on that very issue. So that's one. Um, I think all parties are interested in uh, improving health care for citizens, improving education, and improving job opportunities. So I think there are a number of different areas that I could see um, politicians coming together to work together because ultimately at the end of the day I think everyone really wants this nation to succeed and they want all citizens to succeed as well. And like I said you I mean you came here during that time of the elections one is coming up maybe in in two years time right. um, is there any thing in particular that you think oh, could that Guyana can do differently? Well you know you just held local elections and those went very smoothly and I understand GCOM is drafting a report that may have some additional recommendations where things could be improved along uh, around the margins. And I think that's very important. It's always important to reflect when you have these uh, elections and see where you can do even better. Um, so I would just encourage people to look at those recommendations. A number of recommendations came out of the 2020 elections. Um, so I, I would encourage, uh, as it gets closer, 
to 2025 to take a close look at all of those recommendations and check off what's been done and work on ones that haven't been accomplished yet. And I would say it's, it's important to not wait to the last minute because um, some of these recommendations may take some time. Uh, one that I know came out of 2020 was to make some of the polling stations more, accept, uh, more accessible to people with disabilities, with physical disabilities. And uh, that might take some time because that involves infrastructure and, uh, you know, really creating, um, you know, a, potentially a new building for, for folks or working on an existing building. So, again, I would just encourage uh, early, an early look at recommendations. Right. And um, in your time here, you've had two secretaries of state, yes. two secretaries visit. <laughs> I wondered what you're most proud of in, in your term in Guyana. Well, I am most proud of working with an amazing U.S. Embassy team uh, to strengthen and deepen this bilateral relationship. I really, that was one of my top goals before I came here, and I think we have accomplished it. I think I'm, I'm leaving with a, 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 a relationship that is excellent. And I would just point out areas that we've cooperated in, like governance, where we've worked um, to provide assistance to Guyana to the Guyana Revenue Authority, for example, to improve its ability to audit large contracts. Through USAID, we helped Guyana become a member of the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative so it can look at that important sector here in Guyana. And we continue to work on, with all kinds of institutions to help Guyana build them, strengthen them, make them more transparent, more accountable. On the economic side and commercial side, um, we talked about that a little bit at the beginning of the interview, and I've been thrilled to bring so many U.S. companies here to, again, tell them about, the, about Guyana and all the opportunities here. But I've also been very happy to work with my team to stand up um, uh, efforts to encourage entrepreneurs to look into, Guyanese entrepreneurs to look into opportunities. We now have an academy for women entrepreneurs, for example. It's operating in three of the 10 regions, and that's just in two years. So who knows where that will go? But I've met with these women many times, and they have so many creative ideas about small businesses that may change things here in Guyana quite a bit. Um, and then again, on the security front, the security cooperation is excellent. We work very closely with the GDF and the GPF uh, to work not only on um, capacity building issues, but on uh, helping them acquire assets that they might need, helicopters, boats, vessels, I should call them. Uh, and Boats are coming in soon? <laughs> uh, fairly soon, fairly soon. So we've worked on, uh, on all of those areas. But as you noted, I am also extraordinarily proud of uh, the ability to uh, bring in high-level visitors from the United States. Yes, two secretaries of state have been here, two different administrations. Um, we've had three Southern Command uh, commanders, well, two commanders, but one came twice, visits. We've also had a number of assistant secretaries of state, deputy assistant secretaries of state, congressional delegations, pretty sizable congressional delegations. The last, uh, well, the second to last one with, was with the very powerful House Ways and Means Committee. So this is really amazing for Guyana to have um, had these, these many visits, but I also can't thank Guyana enough for agreeing to having all these visitors. You know, sometimes it's a little stressful and puts a little pressure on systems and whatnot, but um, they have all been welcomed here, and I think they've um, helped, again, to strengthen and deepen that bilateral relationship. And finally, I just wanted to ask you if there's anything in particular you'll miss about being here. Everything. <laughs> <laughs> I will miss the food. I will miss uh, the the birds. I love the the scarlet ibis, for example, is my favorite. But don't want to leave out the kanji pheasant. Love that. The howler monkeys. I've been able to, you know, in my first year here, Neil, I made it a priority to get out to every region at least once, and I was successful. And I'm so glad I did that because then we had the onset of COVID, and I couldn't travel as much for the following year and a half or so. Um, but since then, I've 
up and back out there. And, you know, I will miss your beautiful coastline, the incredible mountains, the savanna is just breathtaking, sunset in the savanna, sometimes sunrise, you have to get up early to see the anteaters, I know. So um, I will miss all of it, but uh, I've been saying consistently, I will mostly miss the people. The people have been um, so warm and so friendly, and uh, I... I just can't say enough about um, the wonderful experience I have had being a guest in your country for almost five years now. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Thank you, Neil. Pleasure.